Burnett webinar. The first presenter that we have with us today is Martin Kihi. We'll just wait a moment while his slides up open. Uh, Martin is the VP of Products for GED Testing, so he has some very important information to share with us today. And I'll now turn it over to him. Okay, thank you very much, Marcel, and welcome to all of you. I'm glad you could join us uh, this afternoon. Um, I have quite a bit of information to cover with you, uh, and some of the slides will go by a little quickly, but again, you'll be able to download all of this, and there's plenty of information for you to look at and review after the session today. And uh, as we're going through, I think we're going to take questions uh, toward the end of the session, but if there are particular questions or clarifications, you can, of course, type those into the chat box, and uh, uh, we'll be able to uh, answer them a little bit later. So again, I'm Martin Kay, a VP of Products at GD Testing Service. And I've got a few goals that I wanted to cover with you today. Uh, firstly, I want to just talk very briefly about why we developed this new GED test. Uh, and then I want to spend most of the time talking about the major differences between the 2002 series that most of you are familiar with and the 2014 GED test. I also want to uh, describe the resources that we have available in what we call the GED program. One of the features of our new system is that we don't just have only the test. We have a lot of other systems and processes that surround it that help uh, test takers, educators, and administrators. And I want to walk you through very briefly some of those kinds of things. And then I want to show you uh, where you can get access to all these different resources uh, on our website and, and other places. So briefly, you know, why did we develop this new test? Well, it really was a reflection of uh, our changing economy and the landscape of education and the workforce in the country. You know, we're, uh, we used to have a, a time in which high school uh, graduates could get uh, plenty of jobs and they could support their families. And of course, as the years have gone by, that's been less and less the case. And so our GED graduates, just like high school graduates themselves, really have not been set up for success in today's world of post-secondary education. And there's fewer and fewer jobs available uh, to them. And you can see on the slide uh, that um, at least 63% of jobs require more than a high school diploma. They don't necessarily require a four-year college degree, but many jobs today require uh, these, uh, some type of post-secondary credential. And so uh, students and test takers just don't have the skills that jobs required. And so something else really was, was needed. And so that's why we developed our test in a new way. So our focus now is on the test taker, not the test. So we've spent most of the last 70 years really focusing on writing the test and sending it out and having people take it. But we didn't really have uh, much in the way of support. And so lots of supports uh, grew up differentially around the country. So uh, some states like California have a certain uh, process that they put in place. Other states have very, very different kinds of processes and less help for people. And so we wanted to make sure that test takers around the country had uh, more of a similar uh, experience with the test and preparing for it and so that they would get you know, the kinds of supports that they need before and after, that they have access to study tools, that they have more of a, a, a consistent process to schedule their tests, that the test process itself is easier for them, that they have feedback um, and information available to them, and that they're able to make uh, their transitions to jobs in college more quickly as a result of all of that. Our GED program then is uh, focused on the test taker. But of course, the test is the centerpiece of, of our program. Uh, everything is kind of keyed off of the test. And we have a number of different systems that I'll talk about a little bit later in the presentation. So we have uh, the MyGED portal that's uh, today for test takers. A little bit later this year, we'll have a MyGED portal uh, that's especially for educators. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, later in the presentation. We have our GED Ready uh, official practice test. Uh, we have an enhanced score report that supports the GED Ready practice test, uh, as well as the operational test. Uh, we have credentialing services that, that uh, help to produce uh, a, what we call a smart transcript that uh, institutions and employers can uh, look and at and know that it's a valid document, as well as understand a little bit more about what someone has 
uh, what the performance means on the test. We have a system called GD Analytics that looks at all the data underlying the system and helps administrators to really focus in on uh, how they might be able to make their program more effective. And then we have another system called GD Manager which helps to manage accommodations and a number of other approval processes that go along with the test. So let's focus on the test now and talk about some of the changes uh, that uh, have taken place between 2002 and 2014. So first of all, our 2014 test has three purposes, uh, which is a little different from our 2002 test. In 2002, we really were only providing results that led to the award of a high school equivalency credential. So we maintain that in 2014, but we're adding two additional purposes. One is that we want to provide evidence of readiness to enter workforce training programs, careers, or post-secondary education. Uh, and that's a performance level indicator that we call GD with honors that's reflective of college and career readiness. And then we also want to provide actionable information about someone's academic strengths and weaknesses. Those of you that are familiar with the 2002 test know that when it came to score reporting, we reported a score and somebody knew whether they passed or failed and what number their score represented. But they didn't really know what that meant in terms of any kind of skills or what they might need to do if they needed to get more points on something. There was really no guidance. And our system is much more robust now and we have uh, detailed score reports that can really help people understand uh, their strengths and weaknesses and how to move forward. So our 2014 test is aligned to leading content standards. Uh, we started with the Common Core state standards um, and then of course some states have some different uh, standards that are similar but not quite identical to the Common Core state standards and so we've incorporated them uh, as well. But for California uh, the, the emphasis is really on career and college readiness um, and uh, we, we aligned to the Common Core and there was a report uh, last year that was uh, put out by um, the U.S. Department of Education that talked about the applicability of those standards for adult education. And so uh, the GED testing service was instrumental in helping the U.S. Department of Education actually conceptualize uh, this uh, set of work and this report. One of the things that underlies our test is uh, Webb's depth of knowledge. So one of the things that our test measures more than ever is uh, higher order thinking skills. And uh, in the past, uh, this is we've used uh, uh, the model of Bloom's taxonomy, uh, but now uh, the, the model that's in vogue uh, is really depth, Webb's depth of knowledge, and that looks at the complexity of the task that someone is uh, working on. So it's not only the difficulty of what they're working on, but also the number of different uh, mental processes that they have to engage in to um, do a particular task. And so the test uh, focuses on the first three levels of uh, web depth of knowledge, recall, uh, skills and knowledge, concepts, and strategic thinking. Uh, level four extended thinking is beyond the range of a time-bound uh, standardized assessment. Uh, extended thinking is something that usually has to be uh, measured over some um, days or weeks or even months. Um, and so we're not able to do that on the test, but we do focus on the first three levels and most of the test is focused on levels two and three. So we do have a new test structure in 2014. Our content is organized into four modules rather than five. We've combined reading and writing into one module that we call reasoning through language arts. And uh, that makes sense in terms of the common core as you look at the way the content is organized. Uh, writing is always done in response to reading. And so uh, it's important that we uh, assess both of those areas uh, together. Uh, below on this chart you have uh, the table that lists the name of the module, the number of test items that we have, the raw score points, and then the number of minutes that we allow on the test. And so uh, the test structure is a little different than it was in the past. So you see that the t number of test items uh, varies from a high on reasoning through language arts of 51 uh, to a low of 34 items on science. But the number of science doesn't tell the whole story uh, because not all the items are worth one point as they were in the past. We have uh, some items that are worth multiple points. So for example, uh, RLA has a um, extended response which is analogous to what we used to call the essay. That one item is worth uh, 12 raw score points out of the total 65. 
Similarly, social studies has one uh, extended response item that's worth eight points out of the total raw score points of 44. Uh, and then we've divided the test into various modules. There's some introduction screens. Uh, RLA is the longest uh, module because it uh, combines reading and writing, so there is an embedded break. Uh, but the others uh, don't have a break. They're just uh, taken uh, straight on through. And so you see that the total test time uh, goes from 150 at uh, RLA uh, down to 90 on science and social studies with math in the middle at 115. So the total amount of testing time is about seven and a half hours, very similar to what it was on the 2002 series. One of the important things about the test is that, of course, it is primarily a computer-based assessment, and that supports the digital literacy needs of test takers as they move uh, into post-secondary education and jobs. There's almost no job that you can think of today that doesn't use technology. And so uh, that that's, was really an important aspect of our development of our new test. We also um, recognize that uh, uh, we're not requiring a whole lot of skills here, but just some basic skills that people need to be uh, familiar with. And some of those skills are outlined on this next screen. So uh, we require somebody to use a mouse. There is some basic keyboarding skills required uh, to do things like um, drag and drop and to enter text for the extended and other constructed response items. Uh, and then the ability to use some different tools that are embedded in the testing software. So for example, uh, we'll have an on-screen calculator. There's a, um, a formula sheet. Um, for example, there's some other exhibits that uh, test takers can access uh, at different points during the test to uh, assist them. Um, and these are all things that are available outside the test that people should become familiar with and they should practice these skills uh, on our computer skills tutorial, which is available on our website 24-7, uh, 365, and it's also available in the MyGED portal uh, when someone uh, creates an account there and uh, it starts preparing for the test. We do have new item types on, on the exam, and the reason for this is that uh, while multiple choice uh, items are good, and they measure a lot of things. They are not the best at measuring all the different uh, content uh, on the new test and that's uh, aligned with the Common Core State Standards. And so uh, we have a number of different items, still multiple choices. The majority, probably over 50% of the items are still multiple choice. But we do have fill in the blank items, uh, drag and drop items, hot spot, drop down, and then two categories of constructed response items short answer and extended response. And so rather than go into the detail of all these item types right now, um, you can uh, access all of them by going out to our website and um, accessing the Assessment Guide for Educators. So it was published about two years ago. And uh, that's on our website. And a little bit later in the presentation, I'll tell you how to get that. But all these items are described in lots of detail. And you can um, see examples of them uh, in numerous places on our website. Uh, with our new test, we do have a new score scale. So uh, on a previous chart, I re was referring to the raw score points. And so, uh, you know, for example, RLA had 65 raw score points and uh, science had uh, um, 30, uh, 34, uh, sorry, 40 raw score points um, and so forth. What we do is to make the test uh, more comparable between content areas is that we do a transformation of those raw score points to a scale score. And, and we change the scale from what it was in the past, which was 200 to 800, to 100 to 200. And the scale, a scale score choice is really uh, something that it, it doesn't have a lot of significance. We just try to choose something that is uh, easy to work with, uh, memorable, and um, that is different from what we've had in the past so that it's easy for someone to know at first glance what test they're working with, that they're working with the results of a 2002 test or, or earlier or the 2014 test. So uh, each of the content modules are measured on this scaled score of 100 to 200. Um, there are three performance levels. So we have a performance level that's below passing, which is below high school equivalency that goes from 140 to one, uh, sorry, 100 to 149. Passing, which is the high school equivalency level, which is 150 to 169. And then the GED score with honors, which signifies uh, career and college readiness of 170 to 200. 
And the results uh, were standardized and normed on a national sample of high school graduating seniors from the class of 2013. So we recruited uh, students who were receiving their diplomas uh, last spring, and they took the uh, operational GED test in the summer, and that allowed us to uh, norm the test uh, on that uh, nationally representative sample. A few other facts about the test. Uh, we have a Spanish test available that was available since January 2nd. So it's the first time the testing service has been able to launch the Spanish test at the same time as the English test. Uh, we do have a wide array of, of accommodations available. Uh, some of these are listed here. This is by no means all of them. So we have Zoom text. We have the ability for a test taker to choose an alternate color palette, either based on their preference or because they need a particular palette as an accommodation. We have Braille. Uh, we have a screen reader. Uh, of course, we have the most common um, uh, accommodation, which is extended time. And we allow paper testing for certain special circumstances in which paper is needed. Uh, the test is also administered in secure testing centers, not via the internet. So lots of times I hear people talking about the online GED test, and that's a little bit inaccurate. It's not an online test. It's a test available in a, a computer-based testing center. Uh, one of the important attributes that we have of our new test is that we have the GED Ready Official Practice Test. And um, this has a special relationship with the operational test that was not present uh, in the past between the uh, old official practice test, the OPT, and the 2002 series. So the, the scores that are generated from the GD Ready are actually predictive of the results on the operational test. And so uh, we report scores on the GD Ready in three zones, red, yellow, and green. A red is not likely to pass, yellow is too close to call, and green is likely to pass. And our results uh, to date are very, very uh, positive with GD uh, Ready in that uh, over 95% of the test takers that score in the green zone do pass that module on the next attempt. Uh, for yellow, I think it's about uh, two-thirds of them uh, pass on, on the next attempt. And red, it really, you really are not likely to pass. Only about 30% of those test takers go on to pass without uh, remediation. So one of the benefits of this particular practice test is that it gives you not only this reporting information on the zones, but a uh, associated with that is lots of information on the um, skills and knowledge that you are maybe maybe lacking that you need to uh, review to score higher on your next attempt. In general, our performance feedback has a number of different categories. Uh, we tell folks what skills they're good at because one of the things that's important is for people to build on skills that they do have. And even if someone hasn't attained high school equivalency, they still have significant skills and uh, you know, they should know what it is that they're good at. Uh, then uh, we also do an analysis of items that someone has missed on the test and uh, provide them with a list of skills that they need to work on to improve their performance. We also have worked with about 19 different publishing organizations uh, to create study suggestions that are cross-referenced uh, with those uh, particular materials. And uh, so that's something that's a very flexible part of our score reporting system where someone can go in and they can just select the uh, um, particular publisher that they're interested in looking at those materials. And they can uh, just on a moment's notice generate those study suggestions. So they can do that on a variety of different publisher materials. And then for the first time, we give feedback on the constructed response scores. So in the past, as you probably know, uh, when someone wrote an essay, um, it received a score, and that was kind of baked into their final uh, score on the um, writing test. But we never told anybody what, how they did on that item and, and how it stacked up uh, against the rubric and so forth. Well, the score report now does uh, give that kind of feedback and uh, provide some narrative about how uh, people can improve their writing skills uh, to score higher. So the next few slides are going to take us through some of the major changes uh, between uh, on each one of the modules. And one thing I'm going to post in the chat window for everyone uh, is uh, a uh, link to a content uh, comparison guide, uh, which is uh, on our website that, that uh, is a crosswalk of the content of the 2002 test and the 2014 test. And so that should um, appear uh, in the 
in the chat uh, window uh, in just a second there. So on um, Reasoning Through Language Arts, the focus is a little different than it has been in the past. So we were focusing 75% uh, on informational text and only 25% on literary. But there is academic workforce and literary context, and there is a range of text complexity. So uh, in, on tests in the past were all geared around sort of a, maybe a ninth or 10th grade uh, reading level. Uh, but now we have a range. So there, there are some materials that are uh, at a lower level, probably sixth or seventh grade. Uh, because that's the reality of the, of the environment out in the real world is that you have to deal with different kinds of text complexity. And so there's some simpler materials and then there's some uh, materials that are more like the 12th grade or uh, uh, entering college material uh, that uh, allow us to measure those higher level skills. Uh, there's a little bit more text on the test than there has been in the past. Uh, and we do have uh, emphasis uh, on vocabulary uh, that crosses uh, different disciplines. Um, it's, it's not sort of like the words that were just eliminated in the new SAT, uh, but it's, it's words that, are, that have applica application in a broad uh, areas of uh, either jobs or post-secondary education. On mathematical reasoning, uh, the test is uh, basically split between quantitative problem solving and uh, algebraic problem solving. So it, the emphasis is on problem solving. We do have a few items that test procedural skill and fluency. And so there are actually are five items on the test out of uh, 49 score points out of 46 items. Five of those items test um, calculation skills. And so those are uh, items in which the calculator is not allowed. Uh, but the items are all placed within uh, academic and workforce context. And we also have uh, some statistics and data interpretation standards that show up on the social studies and science tests. And we do uh, allow the on-screen calculator for the vast majority of the test items. Uh, on the screen right now is an example of the formula sheet, the new formula sheet, and the on-screen calculator. Uh, the formula sheet also is a little different than it has been in the past, and there's a real helpful um, annotated formula sheet on our website, and I'll show you where to get that in a little uh, while so that you can uh, uh, download that, and that'll help you and your students become familiar with this new formula sheet. Uh, for science, the focus is on science practices. So again, these skills of reasoning and thinking scientifically. Um, and the content is pretty much the same breakdown as it's been in the past, life science, physical science, and earth and space science in approximately the same um, breakdown as, they've, as we've had in the past. Um, so we do test uh, you know, textual analysis and understanding, data representation and inference skills, as well as problem solving. And about half the items are in some type of scenario. They're not extensive scenarios, but they are scenarios that, that really reflect these uh, kind of context that someone might see in the workplace uh, or in post-secondary education. And all the items are aligned to both a science practice and a content topic. Social studies is similar in that there are social studies practices derived from the common core that show the skills of analysis, um, thinking and reasoning, and uh, social studies uh, content is approximately the same as it was in the past, a little bit different distribution. There's a little bit more emphasis on civics and government uh, than there was in the past. Uh, as our, we developed this test, our social studies experts uh, felt it was important uh, to really focus on um, knowledge that would be a good uh, for citizens to have. And again, uh, the same kinds of textual analysis and understanding data representation and inference skills uh, that are present in the science test and now on social studies with social studies content. And the social studies practices and the content topics are reflected in each of the items. OK, just briefly, I want to just walk through some of the um, uh, uh, aspects of the MyGED system that supports the test, because this is a, a major a step forward for us. So uh, on MyGED is a, a place that uh, uh, it's our portal. Uh, it's free to sign up. Anybody can sign up uh, and create an account on here, uh, even if someone is not uh, looking to take the test, if they just want to take advantage of the uh, tools and resources there, they can do that. So they just go to ged.com and they create an account, and uh, they have access to all the tools there. So a number of the tools are up here on the screen now. So um, there's uh, study tools that are available. 
Uh, you can create your own study plan. You can get access to study materials. Uh, uh, for local study tools, we are building a database of adult education programs across the country, and that's actually already implemented, and we're updating it all the time so that uh, we find that um, in many states, um, more than 50 percent, sometimes more than 70 percent of the test takers are not taking advantage of adult education programs, and so we want to connect them with that. Um, then they can also access the GED Ready uh, official practice test there. Uh, they also can uh, uh, schedule their tests. They have a, a dashboard that gives them information about policies that are in the state. Uh, they have access to the scheduling uh, and the study materials uh, anywhere, anytime that they have access to the internet. Uh, and they can get their scores uh, uh, once they've taken either the practice test uh, or the operational test uh, by going to this dashboard. I've already talked about their enhanced score reports. They have uh, the score reports are uh, you know, very um, kind of user friendly. Um, you can view the details on any of the score reports that the, that you've taken. Uh, and if you haven't passed, then you can always uh, reschedule your test. We also have a whole section that's uh, focused on helping our test takers explore college and careers. And so uh, there's some. Uh, information here about uh, various training programs, career exploration, and uh, how to uh, think about uh, going to post-secondary education uh, if that's uh, the goal. And uh, uh, over 60 percent of our test takers do tell us that that's their goal, that they really recognize that they're going to need to go on uh, beyond uh, the high school equivalency and go to post-secondary education. And then briefly, we have some tools for educators and administrators. Uh, uh, we're in the process of rolling out GED analytics across the country. Uh, this is a tool that helps uh, folks analyze the test taking population, how many uh, people are passing in each particular area, uh, who might need to be contacted to uh, work on a test that they haven't passed and so forth. And lots of different breakdowns and filters to help uh, somebody slice and dice the population. Uh, again, I've mentioned GED Manager. This helps uh, folks to who are in administrative role uh, manage uh, uh, test takers that are, uh, for example, younger than 18 and might need special approvals, or manage the um, uh, accommodations process. We also have this credentialing and smart transcript, uh, so that uh, the the uh, transcript has a it's a, a secure PDF that's delivered to uh, a school or an employer. Uh, so they uh, can recognize that it's actually a, a legitimate document. Um, and then it has um, live links on it so that when they do get the uh, document that, that an employer, for example, could go and say, well, you know, what does reasoning through language arts cover? Uh, what does the score mean? What does that performance level mean? And so forth. And they can really dig into that information and really understand it. And then last, we have a number of resources I want to just walk you through very briefly. Uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, information on professional development on our website, and the uh, link to that is at the bottom of this particular slide, gdtestingservice.com forward slash educators forward slash professional development. So we have uh, print guides, we have an archive of webinars that were given over the past uh, two years, we have a free practice test, and we have an online teacher's guide uh, that can also be downloaded and uh, worked through uh, offline. We also have a free on-demand instructor training. Uh, we uh, partnered with uh, Kentucky Educational Television uh, to create some uh, self-paced free courses. Um, and this will increase over time. The first two have, were launched earlier this year, uh, one about reasoning through language arts and one on mathematics. Um, and those are uh, offered through the PBS teacher line uh, system. And so those are completely free of charge, and I encourage you to go out there and visit those and take advantage of those. We have some guides to math and writing. Uh, as you've uh, uh, probably seen, uh, our constructed response items are uh, different in structure from the current test, and we have um, some extensive guides to help uh, teachers understand the differences, how those are scored, what kind of expectations they need to be setting with their students. And so there's, those are available uh, in English and Spanish. Uh, and then we have, of course, uh, lots of materials to uh, support our mathematics tests, the uh, reference sheets in English and Spanish, the formula sheet, and so forth. 
Uh, we also have a, a number of different videos. Here's an example of an introduction to the um, calculator, that new TI-30XS on-screen scientific calculator. And you'll see that website that's listed there, uh, educators for sla forward slash 2014 test resources. That particular page has a lot of these types of resources on it. So I encourage uh, everyone to go out there and really explore that. And again, you'll have this presentation uh, available to you afterwards so that you can go through and, and make note of all these websites. Uh, again, we have some scoring tools that uh, help uh, uh, you to uh, score the um, uh, essays and the constructive response items on the GD Ready. And so uh, they uh, focus on the short answer items as well as the extended response items. And so those tools are available to you, again, on that same 2014 test resources page. Uh, one of the important changes that we've made this year is that we have now performance level descriptors. So there is actual content out there that describes exactly what the score levels mean and what skills are involved in each one of the score levels, uh, whether that be high school equivalency or a GD with honors or uh, uh, pre-high school equivalency. And so these are really something that I call the Rosetta Stone to the test. You can really look at these and understand um, what skills someone really needs to be good at uh, to achieve a particular uh, performance level. So those are a real important uh, resource for you. We also have a place uh, on our website that you can download or, or order um, um, materials. So this particular link uh, is for some GED ready uh, materials. And so we've got uh, calculator reference guides, formula sheets, and flyers and things uh, that you can download and print for your classroom. Uh, out there also are some student guides to uh, the GED uh, portal, My GED, um, and how to help people get their scores and know how to uh, do the scheduling and so forth. And those are also useful for you to be familiar with as instructors uh, so that you can uh, help your students uh, familiarize uh, themselves with the, uh, the resources that are available to them. And then this is an important uh, slide that, again, you'll have reference to that lists uh, not all, but a number of different uh, resources that uh, you can find on our website. So uh, I've referred to the assessment guide for educators a number of times. Uh, that's an important um, document that really tells you all the details about our assessment and what it uh, tests. Um, you know, um, uh, on-demand training, professional development resources, a variety of different uh, professional development resources out there. Um, and a number of different uh, teaching and scoring tools that are available for the test. So I just encourage you to um, you know, print this uh, particular page out and have it available uh, for others that might be um, in your uh, programs uh, to help them become familiar with all the resources that are available to them. And uh, there's my contact information. I'm happy to answer any questions at any time. You can email me directly, martin.k, uh, my last name is pronounced K, but it's spelled K-E-H-E, at gedtestingservice.com. And uh, you can follow uh, GED Testing Service on Twitter at, at GED Testing or me at, at Martin K. And uh, so that concludes my uh, responses, and um, I'll turn it back over to Marcella. And Joyce Ludy's here. <laughs> Thanks so much, Martin. Uh, now it will I take about five. Hi, Joyce. Um, we'll take about uh, just two to three minutes. If anyone has any questions for Martin now, we'll also have some time for questions for both of our presenters at the end of our um, at the end of our presentation. If you have any questions for Martin, if you could please type them into the chat pod on the bottom left-hand side of your screen. We'll see if he can answer some of those for us now. Okay, uh, Martin, our first question is, how many versions of the practice test are available on the GED? Right, so for GED Ready right now, there are two versions of the practice test uh, in uh, English and in Spanish. Um, one thing I should just alert you to, that the use of the practice test for GED Ready is a little different than on OPT. 
So in the past, the OPT was really uh, given uh, multiple times to people, and that was one of the main ways that they learned um, you know, the content. That's not recommended for GED Ready. GED Ready is connected to, uh, as, a, as a score prediction to the GED test, and so it's really meant to be given kind of as a capstone um, uh, to an instructional program. Um, that having been said, uh, we will be um, you know, launching more uh, forms of that um, in a few months. Um, uh, so just like with the 2002 series test, we started with a few forms and then we'll be adding to that. Okay, thank you. Uh, someone else was interested in finding out, on myged.com, is there an option for teachers to log in? Or do you have to create yeah, so an currently there system? isn't an option for a teacher login. You would just create an account to kind of understand and get a sense of what the experience is. Uh, we are, as I said earlier, launching later this year a uh, educator portal, uh, it, which will um, allow you to create an educator account and also to uh, see the score reports directly of students that you're working with, as long as they've given you permission to do that. So right now, uh, for you to get the score report, um, you need to just request a, a copy of that from the student, and they can either uh, print it out for you, or you can, uh, you know, um, if you get their login information, you could log in uh, on, on their behalf and look at their information. Uh, just one more question for now, and then we'll come back to these at the end of, of our presentation. Um, someone was asking about the practice test. It sounds like there's only one version. Yeah, no, the, there's there not one more? version. There are there are two forms of the practice test, and there will be more. Okay, wonderful. All right, um, I just want to make sure that we have more than enough time for Joyce's presentation. So you can continue to write your questions into the chat pod um, as you think of them for either of our presenters. Uh, but we'll move on now to um, Joyce. And as it's coming up here, our presenter, um, Joyce Leedy, is a principal at, um, a, at a school in California. And she will be sharing with us a little bit about her experience um, in trying to adapt to the changes of the GED. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Marcella, and uh, thank you to Martin. Um, the information that I'm going to be sharing is really to take the general information about the test and try to narrow it down with what, with what one adult school in California is doing. Um, I, I hope to complement Martin's presentation. Um, I'll also be sharing, um, this is an update from information that I, sh I shared at the State GED Conference in October 2013. Um, and also, as we move forward, realize I'm a former teacher, so you're going to see some of some little icons and, and graphics. But basic topics I'll be covering, one will be um, a general overview of the school, and then how we're able to promote GED success by becoming a, a Pearson View Testing Center and managing that center. And then finally, uh, some information on what we're doing for test preparation. Uh, when I look at the number of people who are here, there's a lot of individuals who are um, teachers and involved with test prep realize I'll be sharing information, but I'll most likely have to uh, forward some of uh, some additional information um, to and from our teachers. So let's go ahead and get started. A little bit of a background uh, that Roseville is in a suburban location just northeast of Sacramento on the I-80 corridor to Lake Tahoe. Um, I think it's important uh, that individuals know, uh, you know the size of our agency and can kind of compare that to where, where they're at. As far as uh, some of our summaries, um, last year we served over 2,200 students. The number to the right there, the negative, uh, just basically shows that that is uh, we served fewer students. However, it was because we closed down in, uh, one of our offsite facilities. 48 grads, our 163 12th graders is our, are our concurrently enrolled um, high school students, which really keeps us embedded with our school district. We also have, um, we had 308 individuals passing the GED last year, which was up. 
up and also 24 test sessions. Now when we look at what's been going on from July to February, our numbers are about the same for students and graduates and 12th graders or we're on target to be the same. Uh, we had 222 individuals who passed uh, the GED prior to computer-based testing and that basically was from July till the end of December. Uh, we had 12 paper-based sessions. We had 16 computer-based sessions in that time. Uh, really to promote success, I just put it in three really steps is becoming that Pearson View Center, managing the center successfully, and then offering, t offering test prep for the, the targeted student population. So my first question is, um, I see we have about 40 people here. How many of you are already an authorized Pearson View Testing Center? And if you would respond by um, in the, um, there's a little icon for someone to raise their hand, you can go there and just put a check next to your name and that will give me an idea of how many people have um, just uh, our, our testing centers. So I'm, I'm starting to see that list now on, on that. So if you could just go right now, I'm seeing four people have raised their hand. We've got to five. So these are how many of you are already an authorized Pearson View testing center. So these are, let me just wait till these results come up. And we just keep having more. We're now to nine people. So it looks like a, a good number of you are already testing centers. Righty. Um, I'm going to go ahead then and, and clear that. And I'm going to ask you your uh, the second question. And that would be, uh, let's see. Um, who is interested in becoming an authorized Pearson View Center. And so what that might mean is uh, you want to become one, maybe you filled out the paperwork, but you have not yet been approved. Okay, so it looks, and then I don't have a question for that. I can go ahead and clear the responses. But how many of you have no uh, desire to become a Pearson View Testing Center? Getting some folks there, so. Okay, so it looks like the majority of, of people listening already are um, Pearson View Centers, but we do have some individuals who um, are in the process and then some others who um, uh, are, will be sending their, or their uh, test prep people to other centers. So thank you. So the Roseville Adult School story really was that we were um, approved as a Pearson View Center in September for 11 workstations and our first computer-based test was um, uh, was no uh, November 4th uh, of last year and we started small with just uh, uh, three testers at that time and so there was our, our proud to have our Pearson View test logo <laughs> and many people have been interested in um, you know how we do our storage and our check-in um, you know our, our um, Check-in is at our front counter at the school. Our lock storage was to use a, an existing cabinet and then put tubs in there, so it was relatively low cost um, uh, for us, uh, but it, it does serve the trick on that. We also use a sign-in sheet for our um, testers so that we are able to make sure that we have the workstation match who did the testing with us. Um, I mentioned that we had 11 workstations. This is at our adjacent facility at Adelante, which is a continuation school that we use. You can see there are tent uh, cards on top of, the, uh, of each computer. Uh, our numbering with this is different than the numbering of the computers, so that was an important uh, factor we had to uh, get going. As far as testing volume, we started small in November and December. Part of the reason our numbers were low then is because we were still doing the paper-based uh, testing. And um, so that was uh, uh, really a, a very busy time for us when we were doing both computer-based and paper. We wanted to start computer-based early on so that uh, we weren't dealing with the new test and the new delivery system. But you can tell that in January, February, and March, our numbers have, have gone up. And really that uh, uh, in March, you can see we're projected to reach over at least 80 individuals. So again, our, our numbers are, have steadily increased. 
some of the changes with computer-based testing, and I'm a very positive person, so I try to just focus on the positive features. We do not miss the inventory or mailing or error fees or billing. We also really like that there are quick results for our testers. Um, and as Martin mentioned, the ability to test in Spanish is just wonderful for us because we do have a high Hispanic population, and this was something that we could not do before because we did not have staff who spoke Spanish. And with many things, there are perhaps some less positive features. Um, for us, um, access to those test scores have been a bit of a challenge. I know that GED Manager is improving on this. Um, I saw a couple of the comments that said, you know, when will we be able to, uh, you know, measure our, our preparation success? And I've heard that GED Manager will be um, modified uh, so that we'll be able to access some of these test results, not just by student, but by agency. And that should also help with our WIA up updates. Um, the other thing which we are working through is the Pearson View proximity. We've got some time zone differences, and we're learning about GED Manager for accommodations and age exceptions. Again, none of these are deal breakers with us, but just have to be real honest. And I suspect that maybe some of you that are out there at testing centers may have some of these same uh, uh, features. Uh, or, or feelings. Um, as far as our test schedule, uh, when I've gotten together with other testing facilities, they always we always talk about when we test. And um, for us, Mondays uh, have worked well because the testing room is available at noon. It also has worked well because we've had we've been able to have the minimum amount of office staff uh, modification. So, for example, we are testing right now as I speak, and our uh, noon clerk who normally comes in at uh, from, uh, I'm sorry, from noon till 4 has just came in at 2 today and she's leaving at 6. So with just a slight modification of her hours, we're able to, uh, to test. And that would be the, an individual who is there at check-in. On Thursdays, same thing. Our testing room is available at 3. And we have a night office staff that works until 9, so there's no additional office hours. And kind of the bottom line on this is that the testers can complete the full test in two test sessions. Um, regarding our check-in, we found that there's some rush times um, at the start of testing. Today we had 11 individuals that arrived at the same time. Uh, about three hours into the test, or for us in about another half hour, we'll have a second rush. These are the individuals leaving the test to get their items that have been stored, as well as some of the new testers arriving. So we need to make sure you have staff for the storage of items. And then also backup staff if an incident report is needed. Um, it Sometimes people have to wait while we deal with incident reports. That could be something about identification or some of the other issues. Uh, a, an additional staffing needed for testing, of course, is the preparation of the room. We actually have our test administrator come about a half hour early to clean and start up all the computers. She labels the computers with those numbered tent cards, and we put out the testing materials. That we use noise-canceling headphones and the erasable sheets and pens. Um, for file management, we keep one file per test session, and that includes the, the um, daily schedule, as well as that check-in sheet I described for the personal items, and then um, the rules agreements for each tester and the log sheets for each tester. Um, but we've developed a daily checklist uh, for the office and for the testing room just to make sure that everything is done uh, uh, for those at those two locations. And really our final tips on that test center management is just really, you know, prepare the testing room in advance, have have your tech support available, make sure your Pearson View phone numbers are available um, in case you need to call them for any questions. Um, make sure that passwords are changed before the testing day because sometimes passwords are changed but they aren't updated until the end of the day and that has caused a few little glitches. And then finally, um, make sure everyone's familiar with an incident report. And the reason that's so important is because an incident report just means that something was a little bit unusual. So there's a higher level of anxiety there. And it's just uh, very important that everyone is, uh, is comfortable uh, using those reports, how to submit them, and uh, just you know, being able to move on. Because as we know, you know things happen. Um, as far as te prep, test preparation, I, I did just share that um, the, the uh, 
uh, information on, on specifics, I'll probably have to forward to one of my teachers. But just as Martin mentioned, the test is changing to be very much more supportive and, and similar to Common Core and depth of knowledge and also academic vocabulary. So it was uh, the reinforcement between our two presentations uh, I, I really find uh, as uh, validating. As far as those Common Core state standards, when I, I spoke at the GED conference at the last fall, um, we probably weren't as familiar with this now as we get rid of those we're ready for those SBAC assessments uh, in our schools. We're much more familiar with this evidence-based, um, uh, you know, new new curriculum. Much more aligned with the college and career readiness and the emphasis on understanding and reasoning. So uh, again, this is probably old, kind of old news on that, but just wanted to uh, uh, give you the big picture. Also, Martin had mentioned depth of knowledge, and this is is uh, one of Webb's original. Uh, models for depth of knowledge. Absolutely understand it's kind of hard to see, but you might want to look up with um, uh, with uh, the web's depth of knowledge and really a lot of movement from level one where we're, there's more recall and, list, and listing to things in level three, which is uh, more analyzing and compare and contrast. We also found that um, academic vocabulary is very important. Um, just a quick review on that. Tier one would be the everyday words that we use. Tier two is really what we focus on, and that would be those um, words that have multiple meanings, um, things like data, factor, argument, and the, you know compare. So the difference between the paper-based testing and CBT is like comparing, you know, apples and oranges. And so that's a word that is used in a multiple of of disciplines. And then of course tier three are those domain-specific words like mitochondria and peninsula. What we found was that the the Tier 2 vocabulary uh, is really useful for our high ESL or our international students. So here's your first resource. And uh, um, the, 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 the Advancing Vocabulary Skills by NIST has been very useful. So um, again, that may be something you'd like to uh, look into for academic vocabulary. As far as um, assessment and what we do when we, we start with our test prep students, we have an orientation for our daytime students. That's at 9 in the morning on Mondays. For evening, it's at 6 p.m. on Tuesdays. At that time, we give them a CASAS uh, uh, 529 test. And then um, we also do some pre-test uh, a pretest that's found in the Kaplan study book. Um, our teachers are very fond of that because it helps to establish a prescriptive study plan based on those test, pre test results. So that would be an additional resource. Uh, just wanted to share an assessment. Other print materials that are used, um, I mentioned Kaplan before. There's some other ones there. Um, uh, on that, so again, this these may be useful for you. And really, one of the key factors also is these are the um, these items are out right now, ready to be used. I think um, many of you may have found some of the uh, uh, just concerns when we were trying to order things in November and December, and they weren't available. But everything that I'm uh, talking about is available right now and has been useful for our teachers. Uh, besides print material, we need to make sure that our students have those digital materials. So these are some of the digital materials that our teachers have found especially useful. Um, you notice one of those is basic is from, I'll just say, the old test. And uh, But however, our, our teachers felt that was um, uh, very helpful especially dealing with foundations, uh, some of the foundational skills. Um, our test preparation is done primarily in a lab setting. Uh, we're open about 54 hours a week for a GED preparation lab, but we do have workshops that are held during that lab time. And uh, uh, one of them is to demonstrate the practice tests. Uh, another one is, an ex is for the extended response and specifically working on those skills of the sourcing, um, who wrote the document, when was it written, how reliable is it, why or why not, um, contextualization, 
you know, when and where was the document created, what's different from then until now. Uh, an example was, um, you know, if there's a, a reading about technology, was it, you know, was it now or was it 10 years ago uh, when this was, was written and, uh, you know, which of these might be the better source. And then close reading, looking at whatever kind of claims are made, and then analyzing the words and looking for evidence. And then finally, I, um, I think Martin talked about the, some of the, the calculator videos and, and things. We also do a calculator demonstration. Students use a handheld calculator that matches what's used on the test. And then the, the demonstration moves uh, forward uh, where they're actually doing um, some, um, some uh, computer-based uh, calculator demonstrations. As far as um, our student support, uh, we do offer uh, the uh, official tests and uh, we give those to our students free. This is after um, they've been with us. We want to try to get a, a CASAS pre and a post test. The cost to us for four um, of the official practice test is around $16. We just give them numerical vouchers for those and then they can do those either in class or at home and then if they want to they can go ahead and buy more vouchers and that's on their own. But that is one of our um, uh, incentives on that. Um, as far as the use of technology, I think one of the uh, kind of nice surprises is that um, technology has really not been a problem uh, with our test takers. Um, we, we do have computers and tablets available in our testing room. Uh, we have a special keyboarding uh, class that is available um, two nights a week. So if people uh, want to um, access um, uh, the the keyboarding, then they can go ahead and go to go to that lab. For many of our students, we found it useful to start with paper-based assessment and preparation, and then when they feel more comfortable with the test, move on to computer use. And just as a kind of a success story, we had an 82-year-old gentleman who just uh, was, you know, used two fingers to hunt and peck, and he was able to uh, pass the official practice tests uh, in a computer-based format. So that was, you know, that really helped uh, kind of validate that um, that, that was working because he was anything uh, from a digital uh, from being a digital native. So that pretty much brings it to the end of some of the information that's being done at Roseville um, Adult School. Um, I will share, that's who's been talking to you, um, some contact information there. And again, um, uh, emailing questions and information uh, would be great. Um, and then I, if they're about preparation, I'll forward them to one of my teachers. And, at this time, I think I would really move to, um, you know, if we have questions uh, specifically on my part, or then I know we can also go back to some of the questions that uh, Martin had. So um, I'll go ahead and, and put my contact information back up um, on that and basically entertain questions at this time. Perfect. Thanks so much, Joyce. Again, um, as we did before, if you have any questions for Joyce, if you can type those into the chat pod. Uh, Joyce, we had one question. Yes, uh, um, Sheila asked probably. if we do uh, any other testing besides GED. No, we don't. And the main reason on that is um, because of the limited access we have to the testing room. Um, I believe just because it's used for classes so much, um, so many other hours of the day. Um, in talking to other agencies, I know that many, many um, uh, schools are enjoying the benefits of doing other tests. So uh, it says, if not, is the test center open to the public? No, um, it's, it is closed. It is on a school campus on that. Um, David asked, do you get a discounted rate as an official testing center? Um, no, we used to offer discounts when we were, when individuals registered with us, but now um, there are no discounts um, as far as uh, purchasing items or for individuals testing. Um, let's see. I think David was saying for the practice test. I don't believe that there is a disc that we're getting any special discount. I do believe there is a discount in quantity. Um, Marion Thatcher asks, so your experience is that Hunt and Peckers can be successful on the writing um, items, and I would say yes, uh, that has been um, 
that has been uh, the case. Uh, Tanya asks, do students pay any sort of registration fee or fee to take classes at your school? Yes, uh, individuals for GED prep pay $25 and that is for as long as they need within a school year. So anyone who signs up now can take advantage of all of our services until the end of May and then if they choose to come back in July they would re-register. See a few people typing. I'll wait for that. Sorry, how long is $25 good for? Um, the $25 registration fee is uh, good for the entire school year. So if, if someone starts now, uh, they could attend without any additional costs until the end of our school year, which would be the end of May. Okay, it looks like the last couple of questions might be about uh, technical issues. So um, I'm just going to go to our final screen. And you'll see here at the bottom um, a link to our evaluation. If you don't mind, we really appreciate getting your feedback. That helps us to improve all of our webinars in the future. Um, so just take a few minutes. Uh, to provide any feedback that you might have. And then um, there's a certificate of attendance you'll see there. You can please email chris at cpeppers at AIR.org. On the lower right hand side of the screen, you'll see the links to download the two presentations that we saw today. Now I wanted to go back. We had a couple of other questions uh, that we received during Joyce's presentation that I believe were for Martin. Um, so Martin, if you don't mind uh, jumping back in here, we had a question um, from Mr. Mack. It said, a working model of calculator for student use on computer. I'm not quite sure what that meant. So uh, Mr. Mack, if you can type into the main chat pod and clarify that. Uh, we had a question that said, will the calculator be available for the science and social studies questions that might need them? And the answer to that is yes. The calculator is available wherever it's uh, needed or wherever it could be used even if it's not necessarily needed. Um, I think maybe okay. the question about the calculator is uh, that um, some folks are looking for a working on-screen calculator. And uh, we do have some licensing issues from Texas Instruments. Of course, they're a company that's in business to sell calculators, and they don't like to give their calculator away. Uh, and so uh, the, our calculator does work in our GED computer skills tutorial. It has um, all the functionality that you would need on the test. Not every key on the calculator works, however, because uh, honestly, it's got it's got much more functionality than is actually needed, uh, and so you can uh, use the calculator in that particular uh, tutorial. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, someone asked, "My program needs numbers of students who have passed for program assessment. Will we have access to the scores as we have before to assess the effectiveness of our, our program?" Uh, so the answer is yes, you will have access to the, that information. Uh, right now, because we're uh, rolling out the different systems uh, throughout the country and we're doing it in groups of states, all, not all the states have access to all the tools right now, but in the next few weeks they will. Uh, in any case, uh, your state office has access to a lot of this information already, and so in the short run, you might need to coordinate with someone at the state level to either give you permission to access uh, the information or to you know, download it and, and send it on to you. Um, in the, over the next few months, uh, you, know, you will have access to data just like you had uh, in the past. It's just a matter of uh, rolling it out to make sure that we have all the kinks worked out of some of these uh, supporting systems. 
Great. I, I will Another question I, we had. If, can I can I comment on the access? Sorry, of, of course. I'm so. Oh yes, I'm so materials. sorry. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, we have had a very strong message from the field to the California Department of Education that we need access to um, GED scores, not just sorted by um, name, but by agency. And um, so, I I really believe it. Uh, it is in the works, and the message has gone, you know, loud and clear that we need this for our WIA reporting, we need this for our um, recognition events, and so forth. So um, I ask your uh, just uh, patience because I think we are really trying to to get that word uh, to CDE from the field. So um, just, you know, if if we need more uh, more of a push, we'll let we'll. We'll get that out there, but uh, again, we're, I think uh, everyone in the field is trying to, to uh, request the same information. Great, thank you, Joyce, for that for that input. Um, we had a question regarding how constructed responses on the practice test are scored. Can you speak to that, Martin? Yeah. So this is a very um, lengthy topic, so I'll try to give just a, a, a light overview of it. Um, our, the, the GED Ready um, does not explicitly score the constructed response items, but that doesn't mean that they're not taken into account. So because the GED Ready uh, is a shorter test, we're using the information that we have available to do a score estimation and prediction on what we think uh, the uh, GED score, or the score would be on the operational test. That's based on um, data that we um, uh, that came out of our standardization and norming study uh, last summer. So we had you know thousands of students taking the test, uh, and we knew the relationship of their of all of their answers on the computer generated or computer scored items as well as their constructive response items. And so all of that information goes into making a prediction of the uh, on on their score on the GED Ready, and that we again we've seen that that score is very accurate. However, to give students the the um, maximum benefit in getting uh, feedback on their writing skills, uh, the GED Ready does require educators to uh, score those constructive response items and provide that feedback and. That's what those scoring tools are that are on our website are all about, and so we encourage you to become familiar with that so that you can, you know, provide your students uh, feedback on how they're doing on those. Thank you. Um, we had a question that said, uh, "How many times a year can the student take a test for each subject?" So the students can take uh, the test three times in close succession. After that, they can retest uh, with 60 days in between each retesting op opportunity. So depending on what time of the year they're testing gives sort of the number of, of times so that they could actually t test in a year. So if someone is testing early, they might be able to test seven or eight times. Um, the reality is people don't usually need to test that many times, but that would be available to them. OK, great. Um, and for our uh, participants that work with ESL students, um, someone asked, I found a GED test prep book uh, very useful, or the, the Kaplan um, prep book very useful, but they need one for Spanish. Do you have any recommendations for what uh, people can use with their uh, native Spanish speakers? Um, I, I don't believe there are, are any Spanish materials out today, but the first ones that will come out will be from um, HMH, Stecfon, and those are going to be mm -hmm. available very soon. And maybe Joyce has some other information about things she's using. You know, I really don't. Um, we do not do preparation uh, in Spanish uh, specifically, and we have been told really the same thing, that the Spanish materials are going to be coming out soon. Um, on that, so the individuals who have tested in Spanish uh, are have not been doing preparation with us, but we even just feel that providing the test in Spanish has been helpful, and we look forward to the new materials when they come out. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Um, uh, going back, we had a couple more questions for you, Martin, on the the calculator. 
um, what specific physical calculator would correspond with the online version? Uh, it's the Texas Instruments TI-30XS Multi-View Scientific Calculator. I know that's a long name. TI-30SX <laughs> Multi-View uh, Scientific Calculator. And it, it looks exactly like the online calculator. Uh, we're actually exploring whether we might be able to allow handheld calculators in the testing center, and we're just working through some of those details. So I can't promise that yet, but that's one of the other uh, changes that we might be able to make. I also see a question about the calculator not uh, working in the GED Ready test, and that has again to do with um, licensing issues with Texas Instruments. We have resolved those issues, and so we're in the process of um, making that calculator functional within GED Ready. Um, it'll be available a little bit later this year, so probably long about the summer or so uh, that calculator should start working in GD Ready. For right now, you'd have to have either another um, on-screen calculator uh, that's freely available or students could use a handheld calculator on GED Ready. Thank you. Uh, do you know, Martin, um, currently is it possible at the state level to get, uh, in California, um, to get analytics of the GED? 2014 in the RLA and math tests? Uh, it will be very soon. Um, I don't have right in front of me uh, the rollout schedule for GD analytics, but it's uh, that's going to be completed uh, before the end of April. And so mm -hmm. within the next uh, month, I would say, uh, the state will have that information, and then they'd be able to provide it to programs. Good. Um, and do you know roughly the correlation between CASAS and GED readiness? What score is indicative of uh, success? Uh, we don't know that just yet, but we're in the process of uh, just starting a study. So uh, we're working with CASAS uh, where they'll be administering uh, GED ready and uh, the CASAS uh, test to uh, individuals. And so we'll be, um, you know, the study's really underway right now. and so. I would say by mid-year we'll have that information, but it'll take us a little while to gather the data and analyze it. Okay. Um, do you have a sense when the 2014 teacher portal will be ready? Um, we don't have a date for that yet. I would I would look for that by the fall, though. No, it wouldn't be before the fall. And part of the reason okay. for that is that we have to collect lots of information on programs. And, and connect programs to students and, and so forth. And so there's just a lot of uh, data gathering that's uh, responsible, you know, in part of that process. Uh, we had a question asking, for those in the correctional facilities, how long will the waiver be available? Uh, the waiver is uh, kind of a negotiated thing with each uh, state and then within the state within, with the institutions. So, uh, based on the plans that were filed with us uh, last year, uh, we were expecting most of the waiver programs to end um, probably by the end of 2014, although some do go into 2015. So I can't speak spe to specific institutions off the top of my head, but we're expecting most uh, of that transition to, to take place, you know, nationally within the next, say, you know, 12 to 15 months probably. But again, okay. that's somewhat flexible, and, and we take into account the needs of the institution and so forth. Wonderful. Um, and this is similar to the question on CASAS. Do you know how the GD 2014 test compares to high, the high school equivalency exams? Uh, are you talking about uh, tests like HiSET and, and, and so forth? Is that what you mean? Or, yeah, mm -hmm, yeah, I believe so. Yeah, so um, we really don't know anything about that. Those other exams haven't really released the same level of information that we have, and so we'd actually need to, you know, have that information before we could, you know, make any statements about that. Right. Um, when the test was designed, was there any consideration given to older adults taking the test, especially those who haven't been in school for a long time? Um, yes, we did give consideration to that, and um, you know, uh, so that that was taken into um, account. However, I just have to be honest with everybody. Uh, you know, the, our average test taker, you know, is of course 26. Um, the we have only four percent of our testing population 
that's over 50. Um, you know, 75% I think are under 35. So it's just, it's, you know, we just have a, a skewed population toward the younger group. So we don't want to exclude older test takers, but the reality is that even older test takers, if they want to, um, you know, find employment or go to post-secondary, they're going to need to have some of these same kinds of digital skills. And I think Joyce spoke to that where, you know, even older test takers have, uh, you know, have experienced a lot of success with this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll just, uh, uh, this question, I'll just add, really add that too, that we were expecting that there would be um, more challenges with some of our uh, more mature test takers. And at least in the preparation side of things, they have been very successful. Um, we, many of our students are taking the test one test at a time. And so, you know, we, we don't have very good data on uh, passing the entire, you know, all, all of the four batteries. But as they're working individually, doing about once, one a month, uh, the pass rate has been, uh, has been very good, even for our, um, you know, adults in their 40s and 50s. Great, thank you. Um, the next question was, do you have any data on pass rates for the 2014 GD versus the 2002 GD? Um, I do have some data on that. What I can share with you is that um, the pass rates on the 2014 test are very similar to what they were when the 2002 test was first um, introduced, meaning that uh, when a test first uh, it launches, there's a little bit of a settling in period as people get used to all the different kinds of things that, that might have changed. Um, and this time we actually have you know, quite a lot more that's changed uh, just in terms of the infrastructure and everything. Um, and yet the, the uh, success rates are about the same uh, as they were on 2002. That of course means that they're a little bit lower than they were at the end of the 2002 series, but they're still uh, you know, what we would consider you know, quite reasonable. And, even though the test has only been administered for uh, you know less than 90 days now, uh, we've already seen significant improvements uh, in uh, in people's uh, success. So um, you know we're we're looking at uh, you know passing rates in the um, uh, 60s to between 60s and the and almost 80 percent. So depending on what module it is, so it's uh, does vary, but it's um, improving day by day. And Joyce, have you noticed a difference in the pass rates at your program? Um, it, right now, um, we, the majority of the people who are testing with us um, are not doing preparation with us. And uh, what we traditionally find is our walk-in candidates do better than the students that do preparation with us. Now that makes it sound like, you know, that, that doesn't make, in <laughs> some ways that doesn't make sense. But frankly, the people who come to us for preparation would not even come close to passing if they didn't have, prep have preparation. So I would say right now um, the pass rates on the 2014 is, is definitely are lower uh, than what we saw at the end of using the of the uh, 2002 test. But again, um, it is it's pretty early because we don't have a lot of our of the students who are doing preparation with us passing. So that's going to be an interesting thing with uh, the analytics to be able to look at our, our own preparation students versus our walk-ins. And, and I'm really looking forward to having more access to that. But yeah, the, there's no doubt it's uh, what we're seeing is individuals are having a, hard, uh, having a little more challenge, there's a little more challenge on that 2014 test. And uh, I agree, the same thing happened in the O2 test. We, I was around for that uh, rollout. And at the time, uh, you know, the new technology was a calculator. And, uh, you know, we, we had kind of the, the same, uh, the same concerns. So I think time and more familiarity with the test and better preparation is going to help resolve that. I look at a question from Marion Thatcher about the pass rate for basic GED or for the college and career uh, ready score. And we're just right, right now we're just focusing on passing the basic test. The other thing is we only received our access to GED manager. Um, it's probably been less than a week. So we, we're, we're going through and, and trying to look at the data, but um, our, our first initial, at first blush, it's just passing at, the, at that basic level. 
Thank you for um, getting that question. Uh, we had a question, uh, for, I think it's for you, Martin. Regarding the short answers and the extended response, is there a certain number of paragraphs that is required? Uh, yeah, we don't uh, specify a number of paragraphs exactly. What I can say, just based on uh, the data that I've seen so far, is first of all, for a short answer, that doesn't require a real extensive response. That's why we call it a short answer. That's typically about a paragraph, so it would be several sentences. It doesn't actually always have to be sentences. It can be bullet points and so forth, depending on what the question is. Um, for the extended response items, um, what I'm seeing in the performance data is that people are tending not to write enough. Uh, and so uh, by that I mean that you have to have a certain amount of uh, writing that somebody does to be able to uh, give them a valid score. Otherwise, there's just not enough to evaluate. And so um, one of the things that's a little trickier with the new test is the, the answer space looks small. And so some people are filling up that answer space and thinking that they've answered the question when they really haven't. So it, you know, I would say, just as a rule of thumb, you know, sort of five to seven paragraphs is what you might want for a fully developed answer. You know, you could do it in less than that, but you really have to have a, a, a you know a good amount of writing to be able to evaluate that. And um, people can write that much, uh, you know, in the in the 45 minutes on RLA with with no problem or field test population were adult test takers and they, um, you know, read the stimulus material and uh, responded with, you know, uh, very well in that time period. So I'm not really concerned about that. I think people are just not as familiar with what they need to be doing yet. Uh, great. Sort of along those lines, what percentage of test takers score the honors and is that truly a coveted mark? Well, I think uh, it, it will be a coveted mark. Of course, it's um, new, and so um, it doesn't carry any particular stakes yet. So just because you get that level doesn't mean that you, you know, don't have to take a placement test when you go to uh, college or something like that. Uh, we hope that that does uh, is one of the benefits eventually. Um, the the, um, the that mark was set. Uh, by really looking at data from the portion of our um, uh, standardization and norming study participants who were clearly college bound and had uh, other uh, test results like uh, SAT and ACT scores and, and that sort of thing. And so we set it using that data as well as we looked at a content analysis of what's really required to be successful uh, in credit bearing courses uh, in your first year in college. And um, so, I, you know, what we are going to be doing is uh, follow-up research studies. We've already started this. Uh, we had our um, uh, standardization and norming study participants who, uh, you know, obviously took the GED test, and many of them uh, went on to uh, take uh, college courses last fall. And so now they have some performance data, and we're following up with them to, uh, you know, kind of validate that score level. Right now, uh, depending on the uh, actual exam, we have 6 to 10 percent of people scoring in that level, which is, I think, pretty good for something that is new and has just launched. So uh, this is going to be a developing area, but we're very, very excited about the possibilities because people that are scoring at that level um, really are demonstrating you know, significantly higher skills uh, than uh, you know, at the lower levels. And it, it's very different from our 2002 test where scoring higher was good, but that it, you were just demonstrating kind of more of the same. It wasn't like a higher level skill that you were demonstrating. Whereas on this test, you're definitely demonstrating something that's at a higher level. And, and uh, so we're, we're real excited about that for the long run. I see Jacqueline's had her hand up. If you could type your uh, question into the chat pod, that would be helpful. Um, and we have just a minute left. Um, so as you start uh, beginning to uh, think about signing off, um, I ask that you again click on the link to the evaluation 
and fill that out for us so that we can improve our webinars for uh, the next time. And if you would like to request a certificate of attendance, please email Chris at cpeppers at AIR.org. Um, this is Martin. I guess I'd just like to offer again if there are more questions that, uh, because some of these uh, questions are complex and they're hard to co cover in 30 seconds or less, but uh, you know, uh, please feel free to email me any uh, questions that you have as you look through the materials and uh, you know, find that you have more thoughts about them. And the, the same thing for me if, again, there are some wonderful things going out there in California adult education and um, you know, I know that there's uh, some you know, innovative ideas and, and so forth. Uh, what I was trying to show is basically just, a, um, uh, just an overview of, of what one center is doing. So feel free to send me information. I'll be happy to, uh, uh, to respond. Also, for those who are wanting to download a copy of these presentations, in that bottom right box where it says presentation copies and then there's Joyce's presentation.pdf and Martin's presentation.def, PDF, I mean, if you take your mouse and just sort of hover over it, um, you can click on those. And then when you click on it, just select Save to My Computer. That's how you can get copies, right, right here and right now. You don't have to wait on me to send them back to you. Okay, wonderful. Um, it is now 3 p.m. And yes, uh, thank you. If you could please um, email Martin and Joyce any additional questions that you have. I want to thank you so much for participating. I want to thank our two presenters. I think that they provided some really useful information for all of us. Thank you again. And uh, we hope that you will join us for our next webinar in our series.